class this morning, we are going to be in Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, Hebrews chapter 11, does anybody know what that chapter is nicknamed? Uh, Hebrews, yep, the Hall of Faith. Hall of Faith chapter, kind of the Hall of Fame of faith. Uh, when you think about chapters and such in the scriptures. But in Hebrews chapter 11, I thought we would make a little series of it uh, and go through and speak of those that the Lord speaks of uh, and has, uh, we'll say the writer of Hebrews. I personally believe it was the Apostle Paul. Uh, There's too much evidence for it to be uh, anybody but Paul, really. But anyway, so in chapter 11, we'll begin uh, looking at a couple of things. Um, Chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And we'll pause here for a moment. Father, we thank you so very much. Uh, Lord, we ask you to do help us to understand, help us to uh, see what it is you have for us. And then also, Lord, grow our faith for the examples given here just in this one chapter alone, but also grow our faith that we may grow closer to you. We thank you, Father, for all your love, your blessing, your understanding for us, and your guidance for us. And we thank you for your word, your very love letter you've given to us, that we may know you and know more about you. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. Uh, So basically, you go through all this, and it's like, well... True faith comes from having a hope in something, a desire, or you're, you're looking forward to something, and true faith will bring that. It is having that very understanding, the meat of what it is that you're doing. Um, it's kind of hard because you can't put, you know, here we've got this. I can put my hand in it, I can feel it, I can touch it, I, it's, there's a quantitative element to it. Uh, etc. So yes, you could say, well, I'm holding on to this book. But by faith, I can tell you that I'm holding on to a hymnal, a song book. I haven't opened it yet. It could have been another book. But by faith, I believe it's a song book. It says so, so I'm putting faith in the cover. Living hymns. Okay? Uh, by faith, we do a lot of things, and we don't think about it. Quite often, uh, every day, every day we put faith in things and we put innumerable, immeasurable faith in things. Uh, No show of hands, but if you took a pill this morning, you know, if you've got medication you take, did you make that pill yourself? Did you do the, you know, the analysis to make sure that's exactly the chemicals that are supposed to be, or did you just take that pill? Because that's what it says on the bottle. And to even to go forward more than that, you took that bottle from the pharmacy, you had faith that they put the right thing in the bottle. You had even greater faith because you went to the doctor and you had the doctor say, this is what you need, and wrote it on paper in some chicken scratch that you don't even know what that says and you give it to the the pharmacist and you're hoping by faith that the pharmacist can read and understand and then puts the right stuff in which you've already hoped that the doctor understands and knows what they're doing so see how that faith thing goes right now you you're exhibiting at this very second wonderful faith in those pews you're sitting in they're not bolted to the floor so don't lean back, JJ. <laughs> no, he's leaning forward now. <laughs> but indeed, you know, where you, you, did you build the chair? I, I mean, I build chairs, I build furniture, and there's some of them, as I'm building them, it's like, nope, I don't have the faith. I've tested them. I sit, 
that's, you know, that's the, the, the curse of a chair maker. <laughs> it's you sit in your own chair. Uh, but, it, you know, there's things that that's faith we do all the time. Daily faith. And so we look at it that way. And God looks at it in a way that it's even a grander scheme. And the fact is, when we do have faith, God will answer or provide for us based on our faith in certain applications and things. And so faith is the substance. That's the, it, it, it occurs, it comes together, all uh, right, of things that are hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We haven't seen, again, using a, a secular or a world look at it, we've not seen, we trusted up John or, or Lily or, you know, put together the right meds. We trust that, that these pews are put together so they'll hold. Uh, we trust, we're trusting right now in the, the, the wireless and the microphones, et cetera, you know. Um, and, and so things we can't see, things we don't do. It's, it, it's interesting, you know, fax machines. Fax machines years ago, it used to just, you know, my wife would get so astonished by the fact that, so how does this thing know it takes it's like a photocopier and it takes my letter my handwriting and it shows up in around the world in exactly my handwriting but it's just going blah, 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 you know we just have faith and it's something we do that's not seen uh, and so there's this but with God it's even greater because God knows our hearts God sees our hearts and because of that there's in this there's a substance all right it's a it's an equivocal thing with God it's like for, for God, he can, he has, he has our faith. He feels our faith. He knows our faith. So, verse number three. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. For some Christians, and new Christians especially, and, and for the majority of the world, they don't have that faith. They don't have the understanding. They, they lack that understanding. Uh, I, there were a lot of times that, you know, me being a, a scientist or, you know, a, an engineer and I dabbled in all kinds of, you know, it was, it's, it took a while for me to realize that, you know, the, the creation exactly as God stated it occurs. And I, try to, I was trying to mix in what the world says and, ma and match it with what God says and uh, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother problem. Um, and and uh, it's, that someday I'll tell you that whole account from when I was at Bible Institute. <laughs> and I got regularly schooled on that one. But indeed, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed uh, by the word of God. With that thought in mind, yes, indeed, by, through our faith, we understand how many of you were there to see it? Okay. And so what do we have for proof? Is there a video? No. Is there a photograph? No. Uh, is there anything that we have for proof? All we have is the word of God. And God's word, and this is where the substance part comes in, we put so much faith in God's word that we no longer question, we just accept it. And God is saying, through that faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. Uh, so that things which were are seen were not made of things which do appear. All right. By faith, now we're going to get into our first character, uh, our first person that the, that the Lord is, wants us to know about in chapter 11, verse number 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained a witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. So for Abel, when we talk about this, I think we all understand the, and, and, and have a knowledge of the account of what Cain and Abel went through, Genesis chapter 4. In verse 4, if you want to go there, we'll get it. But there's not a whole lot. Actually, Paul speaks more about what went on there with Cain and Abel. But in chapter 4, 
we find this, in Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of that fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So that's what we have for the sacrifices and what the offerings were that were given, etc. We don't have a whole lot, and you can go into a lot of study and a lot of, of arguing and back and forth over, you know, why is it that according to the Hall of Faith chapter here, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Why was it more excellent? Well, I think we can find some clues. Some would say, and they've gone down to even going, well, you know, it was an animal sacrifice and Cain's was... A, a, you know, vegetable sacrifice that would nothing died for it. And I'm thinking, well, tell that to the wheat. You know, <laughs> the, the wheat died. There was, there was, you know, that going on. But, but what was it? What was different? They're going, well, it was because this one was an animal. And, this, and there is that. But also, if you get further into the law, you'll find that there are grain sacrifices. There what's called a meat sacrifice. And meat is not meat like we call it today. Meat is not, you know, venison, beef, pork, poultry. Meat, in those days, the word meat, and when you find it used in Old Testament and sacrifice, etc., is grains, barley, wheat, flour. It's baked. Okay, it's baked. That's what bread. So a meat offering is typically a bread offering or of, of that kind. So there is those offerings. So that doesn't discount Cain's offering from being right either. So what is it? It's Well, the clues are given to us right here in just the very same verse. This one verse has a whole, whole slew of, of information for us. It says that Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Well, what was so much more excellent? I don't think it was the food or the actual animal versus uh, the vegetable by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. So far, the difference between Abel and Cain is Abel, God's listing him as being righteous, and he doesn't say that about Cain. And God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speak it so we'll see. Abel had a more excellent sacrifice because he was righteous. His sacrifice, it could have been the other way around. If you were to switch the two, it wouldn't have been a big difference. According to what we have here from, from the scriptures, uh, let's, just, let's just go ahead and go ahead and, and, and stop and say, okay, Cain, you bring the venison and, and the lamb and, and the first, you know, and Abel, you have, you bring from the ground. It, though the, the physical things don't matter. It was the heart. It was, Abel was righteous. Abel was doing what he was supposed to do. Where Cain, it would appear, uh, when, especially when you look at further on about Cain and Cain's life, uh, that little bit we know in Genesis, uh, Cain came begrudgingly. Cain came questioningly. Cain came with an attitude that Abel didn't have. Abel had the proper attitude. Cain had a wrong attitude about the whole thing. Um, when, he, when he slew Abel, I mean, that, that's one of your first indicators that Cain had a whole bad attitude in the start anyway. Uh, because quite honestly, what was going on in the family, we don't know any of the details how long had they been doing sacrifices? How long have they had the altar? I mean, go back. We're still in Genesis 4. You know, you look at this. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bears brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was tiller of the ground. So here they, they, brought, they brought their first fruits. They brought their first fruits. And, and we see that. And in the process of time, it came to pass, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. 
and the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. But Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So they both brought the first. They both brought what God had. God had made it Cain to be a worker of the ground, a tiller of the soil. And so he brought what he does. He brought his offering. Abel brought his offering. And, you know, some would say, well, it's because it's a picture of the future look at the Messiah. You know, it's a picture of the fact that uh, Abel brought and, and sacrificed the best of his, fur, his fruit, or, you know, best of his, his flocks and, and all this. And that was a picture of the fact that God had covered Adam and Eve's sin when God provided for them by taking the hides of the first animals and all this. Um, and that sounds okay. And that sounds like, well, that, that would, maybe that would do it until you do, like I mentioned earlier, until you do get into fine, where also God has also said, no, and this is the offering I want. And sometimes even a meat offering or the offering of the grain and the flour and all that and baked enough can be a sin offering. So it's like, well, hmm, what is it? Attitude, total attitude. We find, again, the, in Hebrews chapter 11, we find, first of all, Cain's not in there as listed as a hero of the faith. He's only there by example. Uh, and Abel is. And what's said of Abel, that he was found righteous by God. So you back up to even before the offerings were brought before the Lord in Genesis chapter 4. And what was it about their life? Obviously, Adam and Eve, as they're raising these, because I mean, Adam and Eve, you, you go through the scriptures here and you're just quickly into, you know, two verses she had a boy, and then another verse, she had another boy, and then they're bringing an offering. It's like, uh, toddlers don't bring offerings. Toddlers aren't taking, so time goes by. There's been, you know, there's years go by, and these are now young men that are able to do this, and so they're bringing offerings. Well, where did they get that from? Obviously, they were raised with some knowledge of sacrifice, a sacrificial system. They were brought with some knowledge of offering back to God and they would do that. And it was whatever, however periodically it was then because it was before the law was given, the Levitical law and such. But they were taught and trained that there is God and God does, you know, deserve our best, our sacrifice, etc. And it wasn't going to be a matter, they weren't trained that it was a lackadaisical thing. Otherwise, Abel would have been just as aloof about bringing his offering. So they were taught. The difference is the fact that Abel had the right attitude. Abel came with the proper respect of God. He came wanting to give God the very best that he had to offer. And he came with a heart that was ready and freely giving that where it would appear that Cain came along and, okay, well, I'm going to give mine. Here you go. Here it all is. Um, but he had an attitude, apparently, or didn't have the proper attitude in bringing that. And so we see that uh, in scriptures. It's, it's awful hard sometimes. Um, we see it as Christians. You know, we hopefully have an able attitude when we do bring our sacrifices and our offerings to God. We can't, I mean, that's why when the Lord speaks to about giving of our, our tithes and our offerings, that when we do our giving, that we should be cheerful and cheerfully give. Uh, it's like, you know, Abel cheerfully gave. He had the right heart, the right attitude. Um, you, it, you can see a picture of it, you know, just imagine in your head, you can just see a picture of it. Those who who do, uh, let's say, they're, you know, it's coming up on, they've just, just received their, their paycheck or their, their pension or whatever they're getting is their source of income, and they gladly and rightfully with a good heart put, you know, make out their tithe check or however they do it so the tithe goes in, offerings go in for whatever they're going to do, and they're happy to do that for the Lord because the Lord is blessed and they recognize and understand 
And then you contrast that with a person who's like, oh, I got, we got to write a check to the church. Well, why, well, you know, we got to tithe or we got to give, you know, this or that or whatever. And, it, and it's a matter of looking at it like you're giving it to the church, not giving it to God. And it's a matter of having a, a proper attitude over I get to give back to God that tenth because he's given me everything. Everything I have comes from God because that's a true statement. That's a fact. Everything we have from every breath we draw to every penny we spend to all the articles we have, they all come from God. They're all gifts from God. And so we have to, you know, and the blessing is we, we only give, are required to give him 10% back, a tenth. You know, we should tell that to the U.S. government. That would be wonderful. <laughs> but the, the tenth. And so we're supposed to give that. And you think about it. God says, here you go. Here's 10. I, I, and I, I want to trust you with it. And, I, and I'm going to just exercise you a little by asking that I want 10 back. Here's 100, give me 10 back. Here's 10, give me one back. It's even. And we'd say, okay, Lord, well, thank you. Uh, there are opportunities. I mean, you can find there's all sorts of penalties. You can give, give up to 25, 30%. Depends on how you fail the Lord, you know, much more back, Levitical law-wise. But for us, it's the 10th. Um, there's a picture of faith in there the hall of fame of faith for that as far as giving cheerfully knowing that you just all you're doing is giving god back what's his in the first place Amen. and go from there and that's all abel was doing is he was giving back to god he understood it all came from god and he was giving back unto god with a cheerful spirit and a cheerful heart and god seen it as righteousness um Today, you know, we think about it. Are we given to God? You know, and not just our tithe, but how about our time? You know, God gives us, you know, all day long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 365 days, 365 and a quarter, all depends on how you, you know. But indeed, you have all that time that God has given us, and how much do we, how much do we give back to him? In other words, how much do we use do we spend of our time doing what God wants us to do and asks us to do versus, well, I'll go do this or, you know, grudgingly, well, it's Sunday, I've got to go to the church. Yeah, we've got Sunday school and then we've got the morning service and then we've got the afternoon service. Oh, man, how much more? You know, and it's like, and then my wife says, stop it, you're the pastor. <laughs> but anyway, no, it just, you know, we have this attitude. And then, oh, my stars, look at, you know, how quickly in our current society, churches are shutting down Wednesday night, Sunday evening services. It's just like they're going to the wayside. Why? Well, there's just, there's so much going on in my life. There's so much I got to do and et cetera. And, but, you know, God does give you things, and he can also give you unemployment, and God can also give you, you know, a, a, the lack of funds with which you have all these blessings. Um, you, you know, you, you hear all the time, and, I, and I, I joke about it, but unfortunately, in some cases, it's true. It, you know, you, you're blessed. God blesses you with a a, a raise or a good job, a better job, something, and now you have the freedom. It's like, I can finally breathe financially. And then you get that boat, and then it's like, oh, yeah, but I've got to work Saturday, too, because I just bought that boat, and i got to be able to pay for that boat. So my only day is Sunday that I can use that boat. So church becomes your, you know, the attendance at church becomes the, the victim. It, it loses out because, you know, and, and you think, well, wow, that's a, that's a Cain attitude versus an Abel attitude. You know, uh, a, a, an Abel attitude says, well, you know, thank you, Lord, and we do appreciate that. 
And we'll find things in our life that aren't as important. And if we really want to go do our fishing or go do our boating, in this example, well, we've always got Thursday, we've got Friday, we've got Saturday. I'm not working all 24 hours of Saturday, you know, uh, or whatever. You'll find time to do it when it's important. And, that, and that's the element as well. The difference between Abel and Cain was the fact that it was important to Abel to do what God wanted him to do, but it wasn't important to Cain to do it with, in the manner of which God wanted him to do. I'm not talking about the physical manner. I'm talking about the emotional, spiritual, the, the desire manner. And so we see that. Um, it was it, the difference between Cain and Abel. And for Cain, it festered. It festered in him. And we saw that in Genesis chapter 4. It, it festered and he began, he was wroth. And his anger spewed over. And of course, you know, his there's so much sin involved right there just the attitude for one so his attitude uh the fact that he got angry and you know the bible says he was wroth there's attitude there's there's uh attitude like that brings with it temptations that you act upon and he did he acted upon those he murdered his own brother so what went from simply a lesson, by the way, that God tried to teach him back in chapter 4 again, tried to teach him that lesson. But to Cain and his offer, he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? These are rhetorical questions to him, but he said, If thou do as well, shall thou not be accepted? So his, his sacrifice wasn't a matter, again, there's proof too. It wasn't a matter of it was vegetable versus, you know, meat or, or, you know, flesh. He says, if you do well, should thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. His whole attitude proves that. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Okay, talking about sin. Now, Cain talked with Abel, his brother came to pass, and when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel and his brother and slew him. Right off the bat, we see how sin has now multiplied. It's come to fruition. It's actually come to Abel's death. All because of why? It wasn't because he brought the wrong offering. He brought it in the wrong way. We see that in church today. Churches across our, our land, across the globe. There are people come in and they're bringing the wrong attitude, the wrong, the wrong offering of themselves into the church house, into what God wants to do. And they have their attitude and their attitude affects how they worship and how they, how they give back unto God. Not just, I'm not talking just, you know, tithes and gifts. I'm talking about their, of themselves giving back unto God and they do it begrudgingly and then they wonder, well, they start to say things like, well, I, I don't know, I, we're not going to probably go there because we're not getting anything out of that service anyway. You know, it's like, well, what are you putting in? You know, it's kind of like going to the restaurant and saying, well, I didn't get a good meal. Did you eat? Did you order? Did you eat the food? You know, uh, it's the same thing as with, you know, coming into the, to the church house. If you're coming in with an attitude or not the proper attitude, then without the proper attitude, you've got that defense wall already built up such as, well, I'm, I'm not going to put up with that. I'm just going to let, uh, I'll just wait. I'll sit here in the pew and do what I've got to do, if, you know, for this hour, and then I'll be out the door and all is over, done with, gone. And, you know, I, I, I'll come back if I'm drugged back here next week. Um, attitudes like this that's that's the Cain attitude and, and God showed him if you do it and, and your sacrifice is acceptable which his would have been acceptable the way he if he would have given the right way and we see people you know in churches and they say well how come this person seems like their their whole life they get they're blessed they've got all this God's always given them a blessing you know they're they're always doing so well and this and that and it's like 
go right back to Genesis chapter 4. Abel was doing so well too till his jealous, angry brother acted out on his own sin, which the Bible tells us he has that sin because he had the wrong attitude and that wrong attitude built up the wrong sin. And that whole sin nature was exposed and he acted on it. And so we, we see how that can affect. Uh, again, like I said, churches all over our land and around the globe, unfortunately, people are missing out on that truth, and that is to have the Abel attitude, not the Cain attitude. Have the attitude that, you know, and the understanding, and, and not just to be an attitude, but the understanding as well um, that you're doing this. You know, going, go back to verse number one of chapter 11 of Hebrews. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. All right, the substance of things hoped for. So there's an act, you actually build your faith. It actually will have merit to it, substance to it. It will have something to your faith. Cain did not have that. Cain didn't, didn't have, there was no substance to his faith at all. He was just doing what he should have done according to whatever mom and dad had taught him to do. And he just, the minimum or whatever he did. Because, I mean, he did bring the, an offering but in, not in the proper way, where Abel did. Um, through faith, we understand. That's, a, that's, that's part, you know, that first part of the verse 3. Yes, through faith, we understand the worlds were framed, but I just simply use that part of the, the statement, the first four words. Through faith, we understand. You can use that first four words of chapter 11, verse 3, for everything about God. Through faith, we understand. How many of you have ever been able to figure out, for example, how is it that Enoch, which we'll talk about next Sunday, that Enoch was translated, he didn't die? Well, do you know anybody who's been translated? They're just simply here and then, whoop, they're gone, but they didn't die? Okay, so how do we, how do we understand and take that then? Through faith, we understand. That's, you know, every one of these things that go on, you know, uh, how is it, how is it that, that God would send his only begotten son? You know, how is it that, that Zacharias, an old man, would be told ahead of time that he's going to have a, a son from an elderly wife? And that son was going to be the precursor and is going to be the, the one that announces the coming of the Messiah. And, and you know, we weren't there. We have, it, we have it written down, so it's recounted to us. But it's by faith that we understand those things. None of us have ever seen any of what occurred in the past here in the Scripture. The Scriptures were finished. They were completed you know, uh, around 95 A.D., as John wrote the last. So all of that stuff, all of the promises we hope to see, and we do, we do have our hope, in it, and that's, that's the part about the fact that our faith is the substance of things hoped for. You know, we're looking forward to that time when the very next thing was when the, the trump is sounded and Christ comes down in the clouds and he calls all of us up. Those are the children, the bride of Christ, etc. Um, we're looking forward to that. At least we should be because that's also given to us in scriptures as well, is that we should have a, glory, a waiting for his glorious appearing. Where's our faith in that? Do we have the Cain faith or do we have the Abel faith? Uh, and so we, we look at this, this hall of fame of faith and just with Abel alone, we get our introduction to the very fact that the type of faith we have is much more important than the actual doing of certain things. Um, as we grow together as a church, you'll, we'll go back and we'll be looking at, you know, even King Saul. You know, when he took out, he was given the, the orders to take out all of the Amalekites. You know, kill every last one of them. All the way down through their servants, their children, even their 
their sheep and oxen and ass, everything, killed it all. And he didn't. He failed to. And he was rebuked for that. And the fact that God taught him that, you know, the fact is that the obedience to God is more important than the physical. You know, was Cain's obedience good enough to get his sacrifice accepted? Nope. The sacrifice itself was probably fine. His, his attitude, his acceptance, his obedience wasn't. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for this opportunity to look into your word. And Lord, I pray that you would just help us to indeed have a proper attitude toward uh, your word, your love, all your blessings. And indeed, that all we do for you, we do with a proper heart. And we thank you for all the blessings you do bestow and you give to us. And all those things, Father, that we don't even know you keep from us. Things that have not occurred to us that, Lord, you stepped in and stopped from happening. We thank you for those as well. Now guide us today, Lord. We are gathered in your house to worship you, to hear from you. Guide us today. And may our hearts be true with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.